Let's look at a nice expected value problem. So our goal is to determine the expected number of elements from the set containing one, two, three, all the way up to n that must be chosen so that if you take the sum of these numbers, you get something greater than n. And this is coming from the two-year college math journal from 1979. Okay, so let's work through an example first. And so our example will be the case when n is equal to two. So observe that if we choose one number from the set containing one and two, well, we can either choose one or two. But if you take the sum of one, you get one, which is less than two. You take the sum of two, you get two, which is less than two. And each of these have a probability of one half. And so you can't achieve a sum of greater than two if you only use the numbers one or two one time. So our probability here is zero, our probability of achieving this sum larger than two. So let's say we choose two. So we're gonna work off of this piece right here. And so if we start with the number one, we've got a probability of a half of choosing another one and a probability of half of choosing two. So now let's observe, observe that if we choose the two, we achieve a sum of three, which is obviously larger than two and we're good to go. And then furthermore, if we move down here, either choice of a one or a two gives us a sum of three or four, which is larger than two. Now putting this all together, the probability that we need to choose two numbers is three quarters. And now let's move on to choosing three. Well, notice that that branch only occurs off of this branch where we chose two ones in a row. But anything you choose after choosing two ones in a row will achieve a sum that is bigger than two. Each of those come with a probability, well, a cumulative probability of one eighth. And so that means the probability that you'll need to choose three is, well, two over eight or one over four. Now let's calculate the expected value. So it'll be one times the probability that you need one, plus two times the probability that you need two, plus three times the probability that you'll need three. Which, after doing all of the arithmetic, you get nine over four. Okay, so now that we've got some sort of idea of what the problem is, Let's see how to solve it in general. Okay, so the general solution starts like this. So let's let a sub k, as k goes from one to infinity, be a sequence of numbers from our set one to n. So this is an infinite sequence of numbers from this set. So it could be one, 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 two, three, five, one, and so on and so forth. Okay, and now next up, let's take an m, which is bigger than or equal to one, such that a sub one plus all the way up to a sub m is strictly bigger than n, and m is minimum, or I guess minimal among all possible values. Okay, well, you know, what does this tell us? Well, this tells us the following. We know that a1 plus all the way up to am must be bigger than or equal to n plus one. So that's pretty clear. If you're strictly bigger than n, then you're bigger than or equal to n plus one, just working over natural numbers here. And we also know that m is less than or equal to n plus one. So if our sequence contains all ones, then we'll need n plus one of those to achieve a sum that's greater than n. I think that's pretty straightforward. And that's actually the longest it would ever take to achieve such a sum. Okay, so now let's state our first goal. And our first goal is to find the probability that m is bigger than or equal to j plus one, where j is some number between one and n. So in other words, let's say we are given 
like I said, j between 1 and n, our goal is to find the following. What is the probability that m is bigger than or equal to j plus 1? And now let's quickly notice the following. So if m is bigger than or equal to j plus 1, then, well, what do we have? Then a1 plus a2 plus ending at a sub j is necessarily less than or equal to n, just by the minimality of our m. Next up, we're gonna define two sets. So our first set I'll call a, and what is that gonna be? Well, that's gonna be the set of all J tuples. Well, not all J tuples, but all J tuples with some sort of sum condition. So I'll call them lambda one, lambda two, up to lambda J, such that lambda I is from the set one up to N, and then lambda one plus all the way up to lambda J is less than or equal to N. And then, well, observe that we'd really like to know the size of A because the size of A will most definitely help us figure out this probability that M is bigger than or equal to J plus one, given this condition that it takes for M to be bigger than or equal to J plus one. And let's let B be the set of all J element subsets of one through N. So I'll just write that in words. So all J element subsets of one through N. Okay, good. Now let's maybe box these off so that they're easier to pick out. So there's our A and over here, this is our B. And then next up, what I'm gonna do is define a function that turns out to be bijective from A to B. So let's do it like this. So we're gonna define, I'll call it phi from A to B by the following. So phi of lambda one up to lambda j is equal to, well notice its image needs to be a subset of the set containing one through n and it needs to be a j element subset. So which j element subset works here? Well, it's gonna be this subset lambda one lambda one plus lambda two, all the way up to lambda one plus lambda two plus up to lambda j. Okay, so observe that just by the structure of these lambdas, that ensures that all of these numbers are unequal, so we most definitely have a j element subset. And then maybe as a little homework exercise, let's say you could prove that phi is bijective. So in other words, it's one to one and on to. Okay, but if phi is bijective, what does that tell us? So that tells us that the number of elements in A is the same thing as the number of elements in B. But in fact, there's an easy way to count the number of J element subsets of an N element set. And that's in fact exactly one definition of binomial coefficients. So this is the binomial coefficient N choose J. Okay, so now we can in fact put all of this together to find out our you know, goal probability here. So our goal probability, the probability that M is bigger than or equal to J plus one, is the number of ways that this can occur divided by the total number of J tuples. But observe that we just determined the number of ways that M is bigger than or equal to J plus one is this binomial coefficient N choose J. And then furthermore, how many J tuples are there? Well, if you're going from the set from one to N, there are N to the J, J tuples. So maybe I could write this as N choose J times one over N to the J. So it's really N choose J divided by N to the J, but I think it's a little bit nicer to put it like this for reasons that we'll see later. 
Okay, so now let's see where we can go from there. Okay, so we just determined that the probability that this m is bigger than or equal to j plus one was the binomial coefficient n choose j times one over n to the j. Now we're ready for our final calculation. So let's find the expected value of m, which recall that's going to be calculated by the sum of all possible values of n times their respective probabilities. So in other words, it's going to be the sum as k goes from 1 to n plus 1 of k times the probability that m is equal to k. That's simply by the definition of the expected value. But now check it out. We don't have a probability that m is equal to k. We only have this probability for the inequality, but that's okay because we can in fact write this as a probability with an inequality by taking a difference. So this is in fact equal to the sum as k goes from two up to n plus one of k times the probability that m is bigger than or equal to k minus the probability that m is bigger than or equal to k plus one. So that's clearly gonna condense down to the probability that m is equal to k. And why did I start this at k equals two? Well, notice the k equals one case is definitely equal to zero because that would be a one element list. But if you're taking a one element list from the set containing one through n, its sum cannot be strictly greater than n. Okay, great. And now let's now break this into two sums. So this will be the sum as k goes from two up to n plus one of k times the probability that m is bigger than or equal to k, and then minus the sum as k goes from two up to n plus one of k times the probability that m is bigger than or equal to k plus one. So something like that. Now, next up, I'm gonna re-index this first sum. And I'll re-index this first sum by taking all of the k's and replace them with k plus one. So what effect will that have? Well, now our sum is going to run from one to n because if k plus one is equal to two, k is equal to one. And now we'll have k plus one times the probability that m is bigger than or equal to k plus one minus this, well, I'm just gonna bring this sum down. So it goes from k equals two to n plus one of k, and then the probability that m is bigger than or equal to k plus one. Okay, so we're almost done. Let's go ahead and finish it off. So here's where we ended up on the last board, and now we're about ready to finish this thing off. The first thing that I'll notice is that n plus one, or this index n plus one, is not adding anything to the sum. That's because the probability that m is greater than or equal to n plus two is in fact zero. And remember, m was the minimum value so that you got this sum larger than n. And well, m couldn't be larger than n plus one. And so that, well, like I said, makes that probability equal to zero. So that means I can change this n plus one to an n. And now observe that I can almost put those together. I, in fact, have one extra term in this first sum. So let's go ahead and take that out. So I'll just sneak it in right here. So this is gonna be the k equals one term. So that's gonna be two times the probability that m is bigger than or equal to two. Okay, nice, and I can do that by changing this one to a two. Okay. But now look, we can push those two sums together and observe that this k will cancel with this k. In other words, this k right here will cancel this entire other sum. Okay, and now, well, let's go ahead and start to write this out a little bit more thoroughly. So observe that the probability that m is bigger than or equal to two is the same as the probability that m is bigger than or equal to one. And that's because the probability that m is equal to one is zero, as we previously discussed. 
So this is in fact equal to the probability that m is bigger than or equal to one, but I'm gonna write that as zero plus one, plus the probability that m is bigger than or equal to two, I'm gonna write that as one plus one, plus the sum as k goes from two up to n of the probability that m is bigger than or equal to k plus one. And now observe that here, zero is playing the role of k, here one is playing the role of k, and here, well, we've got this k. So that motivates us to sneak those first two sums into our summation notation over there, and we'll have the sum as k goes from zero up to n of the probability that m is bigger than or equal to k plus one. But we found a value for that earlier. Observe that that's simply going to be the sum as k goes from 0 to n of our binomial coefficient n choose k, and then we have 1 over n raised to the k power. But that's exactly like binomial expansion. So where the role of x, if you will, is being played by 1 over n. So this is gonna give us one plus one over n raised to the n power. And that's our expected value. And I think, well, one thing that's interesting about this is as n gets larger and larger and larger, as n goes to infinity, if you will, we end up with a value of e. So if you've got a fairly large number for n, well, this expected value is approximately equal to e. And that's a good place to stop.